Welcome to My Life, Chassidah Supplied, episode 499. This program is in loving memory of Miriam Baselio, Altez Aleha Sholem, and a merit of Baruch bin Yomim ben Menuchelana, Altez, Yukasil ben Leah Rochel, and Rochel Bas Liba Farkash, dedicated by Pinchas Todris, ben Miriam and Sarah Bas Rochel Altez. As I just mentioned, 499. So we're closing in on the milestone of 500 episodes. 500 episodes when we began over 10 years ago, this special program. And it's really in your schools, in your honor, because this program is structured all around questions generated by listeners. And indeed, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of questions have come pouring in and continue to come pouring in, covering the entire gamut, the entire spectrum of life. And it's a great honor on my end to be part of this process. It's very exhilarating, I would say. Sometimes very painful, but exhilarating in the sense that we can go and dig into the Rabbeims, the Chassidus, the Maimorim, the Sichas, answers, letters, Yechidus, Hear different personal, private audiences, and draw out and glean from their direction and guidance, finding clarity, strength, hope, confidence in dealing with all our challenges, including our most pressing questions. What especially is powerful is the fact that this is a platform, as many have pointed out to me, where really no questions are off limits. The, val- the very validation that you can ask a question even if it's an uncomfortable one, even if it's something that nobody wanted, wanted to ever hear you ask, people are afraid to ask, others are afraid to answer, that there's a platform where it can be talked about is a very empowering element. And I hear this time and again. So thank yourself, thank my whole team and staff to marking this 500th um, milestone as we come to the 500th episode. And as such, we've launched a, program, a, a campaign called My Life 500, mylife500.com. Please go there. And uh, we are, go, our goal is to raise $500,000 to continue this program, but also make it grow both quant- quantitatively and qualitatively in its reach and take all these teachings and all these answers and actually turn them into a database, into books that can be used and accessed So we have many plans, but we need the resources, the financial resources, so please contribute generously. This goes directly to which is, as Mashiach told the Baal Shem Tov, the key to bringing Geula Amitiz V'Ashleimah. And I encourage you to participate in any way you can. Again, mylife500.com. Many derivatives have also grown out of this program. It's the, the annual contest that we ran for many years, contests that have been spawned by it, as well as different classes and programs, including the class on Ayin Bays, and classes on resources and other Hasidic materials, which you can find at chassidahsupply.com, a full array of materials. And it's all listed, again, at mylife500.com. One person wrote, and it's a nice note to to, to perhaps uh, include in this conversation. I am a Jewish man who used to live in Brooklyn, but when the COVID pandemic happened, my business was destroyed. I could no longer afford to pay the expensive rent in the city. I took the small meager savings I had and bought a small cabin in the forest upstate, and I have been living off the grid the last few years on a very low budget with very few expenses. I drive to the nearest town 15 miles away once a week to buy essential groceries and use the Wi-Fi in their library to go online and read up on the week's current events. Send emails to friends and family and listen to your classes online. Your Torah classes are the only connection I have to Yiddishkeit up here. I see you have started a fundraising campaign to finance doing another series of 500 classes. These classes mean so much to me and I appreciate them so much. And it hurts me that I currently don't have the means to make a substantial donation to help keep these classes going. Please, please 
<coughs> Excuse me. Please give me a blessing that it should be Hashem's will that my financial situation should dr- drastically improve, whether by natural or supernatural miraculous ways. And when I'm in better shape, I will make a sizable contribution to help keep these amazing Torah classes coming. Thank you. Well, thank you. Very kind and very touching words. I'm glad that you have access. I'm glad that we could provide this service to you. And um, as I say to you and I say to everyone, these classes are unconditionally free. It's for the ben- your benefit. You know. But at the same time, we do raise the money and we hope that others can help those that are in position to help in a more generous way, by all means. But every penny matters and everything is valuable. Every person according to their means and according to their abilities. And you should be blessed. Indeed, as I say this blessing to you and I say to everyone listening, blessed with abundance, both physically, materially, and spiritually. And God shall bless you much more so you can also turn the material success into spiritual growth by giving generously to Stuck in general, concluding for our cause and other causes that are very important. And may Hashem bless everybody and all should all be in good health. Okay, so that's the announcement, being that we are closing in, as I said, on the 500th episode of my life. This is supplied. Now, as always, we always begin <clears throat> with something with living with the times addressing something that is timely, the chapter in the Torah, the period in the calendar that we're in. <clears throat> and so we we're going to do exactly that. You know, unfortunately, the war continues to be fought in Gaza. Hostages still remain unreleased. Unfortunately, again, tragedies are happening. We pray and hope in every possible way that Hashem should finally have Rachmanus and put an end to all of this. We should march into the Gula Mitis Vashlema with complete Shalom, permanent Shalom, and true Shalom. And meanwhile, Hashem should protect, especially the soldiers <clears throat> that sacrifice their lives to protect the innocent men, women, and children in the Holy Land. And Hashem should protect Jews everywhere and innocent people everywhere. So let's talk about this time period. What does this time period and Torah portion teach us today? Talk about some little follow-up to previous conversations that we had in the previous weeks, as well as some of the new developments and new events. And again, these are questions all generated by you. And I again welcome everyone's questions at chassidahsupply.com. There's a forum where you can post any question anonymously, confidentially, and I hopefully will address it as soon as I can. There is a backlog, to be very honest, but that's only a sign of the success of this program, and we shall continue to address what needs to be addressed and be able to shine the light of clarity from Tata Semis into the darkness and confusion and, um, of, um, and distortions in the, in the world at which we live, and there are quite many. <clears throat> so, where are we? We are essentially at the end of the month of Ir, going this week into the month of Sivan. In the Hebrew, number, the numbers, as the months are enumerated in the Torah, we're going from the second month of Ir into the third month of Sivan, with Nisan being the first month. And it's all part of a journey, not just a journey in time, it's also a journey in our work. Whereas Nisan is like Chesed, a gili from above, a revelation from above, God taking the Jews out of Egypt. Ir is Mamata Lamai, like Gvura, where we do our effort, we count all the days of the Omer, and we do our part in preparing ourselves to become containers, channels, to what to receive the great gili of Tefera Zemat and Tere, the third month of Sivan, which brings together Chesed and Gvura, both mamata lamata, mamata lamaila, from the top down and from the bottom up, all joining as one. So we're in that period, that transition from the end of year into the month of Sivan, the month of Matan Tera. We're also in the week of Pasha Bamidbar. This next Shabbos will be Pasha Bamidbar. It's always this Pasha that's read 
before Shavuos. And um, as I said, we're also still counting the Omer as we count down to the end of the Omer, which all prepares the 49 days that prepares for the 50th day, which is Matan Teir. So how does that all translate into our own personal lives? How does it translate into who we are and what we can be learning for, especially in these times? So in general, in t- general terms, the key thing to remember is no matter how dark the world is, no matter how dark the world is, the fact is that we were given and blessed with Teira. And Matan Teira, of course, is when the Teira was given to us in a formal way. Teira is Teira Eir, a Teira of light. Light illuminates, it warms, it clarifies, it provides direction and guidance, and gives us the strengths. With all the guidance, we get strengths, we get resources. So we're not alone. That alone is already a tremendous asset that we need to appreciate. So no matter what comes our way, whatever battles we need to fight, whether it's battles with our external enemies, battles in Gaza, in the Holy Land, battles within our own selves, with our own Yetzirah, with our own challenges, with our own demons, psychological, emotional, we are not go, we don't enter alone. We come with a Teirah. And we come with a, a time of the year that provides particular energy the energy of Ani Hashem Refecha, which is the acronym of Ir, the energy that leads us into Rishchei Jesivan. As we know, Rishchei Jesivan is the day when they arrived at, at Mount Sinai and it says, by Yichan Shom Yisrael, Ki Ishechad, Belevechad, Loshin Yochid. They rested there, by Yichan. It should have said, by Yachnu. There were millions of people. So Rashi says, for the Medrash, because they were like one. Up till that point, there was discord. They were like one, like one person, one heart. So all this is recreated every time of the year when we come to this point in time. And it gives us strength and direction and clarity and unity to deal with any challenge that comes our way. Knowing that the fact that we can sit, we can, we can rely on the shoulders of giants that came before us, those that pioneered and paved the way, is a whole different story. You're not fighting a battle for the first time. You're not fighting it alone. You come with all that accumulative energy. So that's overall. Specifically is the energy, as I said, of Rashkhaj Sivan, is the energy of the end of Ir and going into Sivan, and the energy of Bamidbar. Let's talk about Parsha's Bamidbar. So Bamidbar, of course, it's obvious the connection. You always read Parsha Bamidbar, Bamidbar Sinai. Right before coming to Sinai. So the whole sefer is called Bamidbar Sinai, Bamidbar. What is its main lesson? Why was the Mantera given in Amidbar? As someone asked the question, why did Hashem give the Torah in a desert instead of a beautiful place? Like Prospect Park, somebody writes. So the Medrash answers a number of reasons. One of the reasons is because the Abishta wanted to make sure that the Torah does not belong to any individual group. A midbar is a Malkam Hefker. It's a place that's no man's land. It's not a civilized place. If Hashem had given it to a particular city or in a particularly beautiful location, um, the, the people, the dwellers of that city, the citizens would say, one second, you want to access Torah, you want to learn Torah, you have to pay us royalties. A Malkam Hefker is a place when you give something, it's no man's land. Nobody owns it. So it's direct access. One explanation. Another explanation, because it teaches us to be like a midbar. A midbar is an arid place. It's not filled with beauty. You have to empty yourself. Be completely empty, like an empty container, like a wilderness and a desert, to be able to receive the Torah. And other reasons as well that are given. So when we start reading by midbar Sinai this week, as we go, it prepares us to the approach of how we should look at Matan Torah. Emphasizing a little more the first point, it tells us that Teire is Teire Tzivilon HaMaisha Merash Akilis Yankiv. That everybody has Yerusha. You don't be dependent on any particular, there's no intellectual property here that somebody owns. We have to pay royalties. It means you have direct access. Every person is given this as a complete Yerusha. 
The Alter Rebbe in the Kut Etei explained, Bamidbar is lo Yoshev Odom Shom. It's not a place where people live. As I said, it's not a civilized place. So there's the negative reason, because it's beneath civilization. It's dry, it's, dry, it's hot. It's not conducive to be able to live there in a, in a, in a way. But he explains the Alter Rebbe, it's also Asher lo Yodom Yoshev Shom, lo Yoshev uh, Adam Shom is talking about Adam Elyon. It's higher than Adam, higher than structure. So the non structure of the Midbar opens us up to experience the divine in an unfiltered and unregulated and a completely pure way. So all this gives us power. So now that we're dealing with, when we have to deal with the challenges of our lives, fighting the battles, we know we're coming with the power of Midbar Sinai. And it's interesting. Gaza is on the border of Midbar Sinai. So the very Midbar gives us tremendous force and tremendous power to transform the Midbar into a place of Mokam Teda, Mokam where Matan Teda was. And from there, should, we should draw out the deepest connection to Hashem as He instills Himself within Teda, a non Nafshik Savis Yahavis. And the acronym for Anoichi, the first of the Ten Commandments, is I have engraved myself, I have written, inscribed myself in these words. Okay. Bamidbar also talks about some other topics, including the census of the Eden. Bechol Shah, Vivos and Mainanes and Bechol Shah, as Rashi says. Why do we count the Eden? Why do we count the Jewish people? He says, Bechol Shah, you found several counts. In this book itself, you have the count here in Bamidbar, later in Pasha Pinchas. That's why one of the reasons the book, this fourth book of the Torah is called Sefer Apkudim, counting. Why do you count? So Rashi says, because when you're, something is precious to you, you count it all the time. Your children, you pray, you count. I remember when it was the year 1992. We're talking about 32 years ago the year the Rebbe had the stroke. So earlier that year, Sukkis, Sukkis in the morning, one of the events that happened that still remains somewhat beyond our full understanding is that the Rebbe stood and watched everyone who blessed his, with his little of an esrog that first night, day of Sukkis. He's looking at each one, gazing. Until later in the year, we didn't understand what was this piece. But I remember when it was, when it was happening, and davening didn't begin till late in the afternoon, after 3.30, I believe. So I remember coming at the shul, 770, someone saying to me, look at the Ramban, beginning of Parsha Bamid. And I opened up the Ramban. Yes, he quotes Rashi. That says, because of how precious they are, that's why you count them. But what does counting have to do with preciousness? Says, because when you count something, you have to look at it. You have to gaze at it. You can't count something if you don't see it. And that's the chibibus, and that's the love. So it came to mind, the Rebbe was gazing, he was looking at every chassid, every yid that came by, and a tzaddik's look has an effect, not just then, but forever. So the second thing we learn, in addition to what we talked about, Min Sinai, is the love. The fact that, yeah, that, is that Jews are here today, after all we've gone through, tells you there's a profound love that's does not allow the Yidin, God forbid, to perish. Yes, we've suffered and we've gone through many challenges, but there's a and when you count something, it's a Dover Kavua, it's established, it cannot go anywhere. So it also gives us renewed strength that yes, we have challenges, but we are not disappearing, God forbid. We will prevail. And with love, it teaches us also our responsibility to each other. When you love God, you love what He loves. Who does He love? His children. The importance of Avis Yisrael and Achlus Yisrael, as I said before, Ki Ish Echad, Belev Echad. All as one. So these are some of the initial lessons that we learned from Parsha Bamid. But someone asked the question, another question, which is discussed in this Parsha, in the coming Parshas, why is it important to know all the details of how they erected and dismantled the Mishkan and who carried which parts when they traveled? It 
if during the time of Mashiach we don't have a temporary Mishkan, but we'll have a permanent base on English. So that just increases the question. You could say during the travel through the wilderness, because it was temporary, they had to dismantle it and then rebuild it and so on. But why is it relevant to us for generations? Tere is So we know the Gemara says, in native, al pi Hashem yachnu, al pi Hashem yisu. That all the journeys in the wilderness was al pi Hashem. And because al pi Hashem, keman de kfi elohudami, became like a permanent situation. Even if they rested there just for a short period of time, in some places they stayed for years. But while you're there, that's what Hashem says, then you're there entirely. Being the lesson that even if it's a temporary situation and they're traveling through the wilderness, they're not staying there. They're going to build a Beis Hamikdash, a permanent one in Yerushalayim. And if the Mashiach's coming, it will be absolutely a Bayez Nitzchi. Mikdash Adnei Kenya Yedecha. But since Hashem tells you you're there, right now, you have a full shlichus there. This is the answer the Friedrich Rebbe gave, the Rebbe cites a number of places. Why? Mesh on the threshold. So why are we building homes? Why are we building institutions? We should rent with anticipation, knowing that it's another moment, then we're off to that's just all with the Gaula. But no, but we build communities. So he said, because command the Hashem Right now Hashem says this is where you have to be. Even if a minute later you're going to be moving, now you have to behave as if it's like a permanent thing. So there's no such thing as temporary in Gedusha. Same thing, when you meet somebody, even though you're on the way, let's say, to an important shlichus, but you meet somebody who needs help, and you help them, you don't say, I don't have time because I'm going elsewhere. Every moment has its value and, and, its, and its divine permanence. So the lesson about, t- t- meaning that wherever so, therefore, the idea that wherever you are, you have to establish permanence. You build up the base of English. And then when we're ready to move on, you, we, we uh, disassemble it, as he, as he says. So it's a continuing process, especially when you take into consideration what the Baal Shem Tov says. Baal Shem Tov says that every person goes through 42 journeys in their lives like the Jews went through the 42 journeys in the wilderness. In some places it says, every day we go through 42 journeys. I actually, a number of years ago, wrote up a whole, should, want to release it as a book, the explanation of each of the 42 journeys in our personal journey of our lives. So therefore, these journeys are happening right now too. Yes, physically they happened in the wilderness back then, but we too are going from Mitzrayim to the Promised Land through our 42 journeys. And we too are building a Mishkan in each one of those leg, each leg of that journey. To make a dira betachtenim. And therefore we have to treat it accordingly. And there's the process of bringing the Shechina down when Hashem rests there. And then when the cloud rises, to move on. We see we've gone through our Masoyas in life. Some of them was willingly, sometimes we had no choice. Hashem leads the footsteps of a person. And each footstep, you have to behave accordingly. The Yachin of Yisu and the Yisu. Okay. In it talks about who carried the Mishkan, different parts of the Mishkan. You have the Bnei Merari. You have the Bnei Gershon, Bnei Kohos, I should start with. The Bnei Gershon and then the Bnei Merari. But that's already going into my Marim El Kutetera where he talks about it in Pasha's Nosei. The, the role that each one played in the carrying and what that void is for each one of us today as well. Okay. So let's now move, since we discussed last week, Buchu um, Kesai, uh, and it's also connected to Teda as we prepare for Matan Teda. We talked about Isis Achkik and Isis Achsiva, engraved letters and written letters. And I explained why engraved letters are a higher level because it's one with the very object itself when you engrave letters within the stone. So someone write, wrote a question, if engraving is higher than writing, why then do we have a written Torah and we write film and mezuzahs?
to spell it out, let me read it exactly inside. If engraving is considered a higher form than writing on paper, because engraving is permanent, and is united with the stone and ink and paper can deteriorate, then why don't we make Torah mezuzahs and film through engraving them instead of writing them on paper? And the answer is, similar answer to what we say, why there's luchas roshenis, luchas shenis. Both are engraved. But one came after the fall, after the building of the golden calf. So in truth, if there was no, there was never a sin of golden calf. There was never a sin of the tree of knowledge. El Pepshitas would have been one as saturated all of existence. And there'd be no two, no two separate entities. God created the world with that simtsum. So it created another consciousness. But the goal is that the consciousness, the independent consciousness of existence of the person should reunite with God's consciousness. And therefore bring the Veniglik Feid Hashem, but all called Basu Yagdav, that the entire world is saturated with Alakus. But once there was the Yerida, then the Tachtein became more intense. The concealment's more intense. So every Yerida is, is to bring a higher Aliyah. Now the challenge is to go deeper into the dark world and connect with godliness as well. So therefore you have another stage, moving from engraved to written letters. The goal is ultimately that it should become completely seamlessly united. But like we speak about, Chassidus talks about Yehud HaTato and Yehud HaLah. First thing you have to do is to find godliness on your terms. So even in a world of a written world, meaning a world where the letters and the parchment are two separate, you want to turn that into Gdusha. You write a Sefer Teda. You write film. You write mezuzahs. Then you elevate it to become to a point where the Eiris and Kalim are not like two separate entities. They become like one like Eish Yisachkik. And then there's a higher and higher Eish Yisachkik, like the Luchas. Me'ever le'ever, through and through. So in other words, in our process of making a Dira B'tachtenim, you have to reckon also with a world where there is duality. A world where there is different levels. Where the parchment and the, and the ink are not one. The so first step is on those terms. <coughs> I think of a teacher teaching a student. In the beginning, the student, you have to first teach all of base, A, B, C. And the student begins to appreciate the idea. But he's not yet one with it like engraved letters. Even though his essence is connected to Teda, an engraved letter, but on a, on a Giluyim level. It's not there yet. So first you say, let him dedicate his life. That the parchment of the physical world should be parchment for the ink of, a, of Stam, of Tzef and Teda, Tzfil and Mezuz. And then you elevate and you grow till the Kalim become one with the air and even deeper this explains all these levels of as we go deeper and deeper until the point to become one seamlessness. But we're doing it in a world where there is two entities. In this case, the entity of ink and parchment. Okay. Since we're talking already about Teda, someone asked a question. Is it significant that a photo is going around social media showing a group that climbed, climbed Mount Everest and brought a safe potato with them and held it up in the air doing a super hagba at the highest point in the world? I haven't seen it, but I hear the question. Look, whether it's a mitzvah to do that, not necessarily. But if indeed it's gone viral and people are paying attention, Everything is Ashrachapraz and it could be used for adding in Yiddish Maim and Tayr and Kedusha by all means. So I would say the lesson would be that Tayr is everywhere, the highest mountain, the lowest valley. And yes, if you can go up to the highest point in the world, the highest peak, and make a Hagba, up, hopefully up, and it should be Dafka, Pialacha, not in an inappropriate way, and all so on. And it demonstrates that in the highest point on earth, what are we recognizing? It's like when they went to outer space, if you remember, I think one of the astronauts took along a mezuzah, or he took along a, sefete, a small sefeteh, I don't remember now. But point being is, if it could be used, and then you say, wow, Kiddush Hashem, and we learned the lessons from it. Now we know Matan Teda, as I discussed in last week's class, was given on a mountain. Not on the highest mountain, Mochich Mokol Taraya and Mount Sinai, but on a mountain. 
which also declares its its value. A mountain is higher than the regular the rest of the earth, but it's a humble mountain, as we discussed. So definitely can be used, and again, always learning Ashkacha Pratis, what we can learn from this in Aveda Hashem. That Teda belongs in the highest point to realize that is the ultimate purpose of existence is to align the existence with the Teda. Okay. Being it's also Parshas Emoir, I'm sorry, <laughs> correction. It's a, it, not Pasha, Pasha's Emer, they talk about the mitzvah of Sfat and Lechem. Being that we're also in the middle of counting the Omer, so someone asked a question, which I'll address. What is the significance? Why do we recite Psalm 67, Psalm of Zion, after counting the Omer? And why is that Psalm sometimes written out in the shape of a Menel? So let me read a short, brief translation of the Avud Raham. Sefer Nalacha from the Middle Ages, where he says, Seder Shalyem, Sefer Abu Draham, basically the 14th century, he says that there are places where it's accustomed to say Psalm 67, and the reason is because Psalm 67 has 49 words. And 49 words correspond to the 49 days of the Omer. It also has seven verses, not counting the first verse. So it also corresponds to the seven verses, correspond to the seven weeks, seven times seven, which is the 49 days. He says also, it's called the Meneda, the, the Psalm, the Meneda Psalm. Why? Because when you say it, it's considered like you're igniting, you're lighting the pure Meneda in the temple. It's like welcoming the face of the Shekhinah. Since you find that in the seven verses which match correspond to the seven branches of the Meneda. Also the knobs and flowers and flames which are in the seven branches of the Meneda add up to 49. How? He says. 22 goblets, 9 flowers, 11 knobs, 7 flames. Total, total being 49. And then he says the first verse has four words corresponding to the tongs, the fire pans. The tongs are two and the two fire, two t- fire, t- fire pans and two tongs. That's what Avud Raham says. This is more Remes, but you see from this that a, a, post- a, a capital in Tilim is not just a capital, it's for the very number of the verses, of the letters the number of the verses, and all the details, all are part of the process. At the end of the day, it's the same as about refining ourselves, refining our midas, our emotions. And when you refine yourself, you become like a walking monada. So that's not a very basic level, the answer to that question. Now, why are we refining ourselves, especially now? Because we're preparing ourselves for matan teda. Best way is to refine yourself as a person. So when you come to Kisha Echad, Balev Echad, you come to Shcheder Sivan, which is already coming down to the last week of the counting of the Omer, you're in a state that you've been counting that has caused a certain unity. Kisha Echad, like one person, one heart. That's what a refined character is like. You can live and coexist and be compassionate and sensitive and loving. Chesed, Gvur, Teferes, Netzachet, Yisrael, Malchus. Which prepares us for Matan Teira, the Yema Hamishim, the 50th day, when we get the great mandate from above. Okay. That covers that. Let's move on. So, we discussed also, we're talking about the battles going on today and the anti Semitism. So, the last few weeks, a lot of questions have come in regarding is it time that we have to all move to Eretz Yisrael? And would the Rebbe say that? We know the Rebbe's directive in general was they definitely encouraged certain people with the condition that they're not needed here, meaning in the United States or outside of Israel for a moisid, an organization, or for some other important uh, role. Of course, the Rebbe sent Shluchim to Israel, but the Rebbe never said in mass everyone should go because 
we all have a shlichus. And if you're in a shlichus and there's Jews outside of Eretz Yisrael that still need a teacher, an educator, a mentor, an inspiration, a place to go to, it's, it would be irresponsible. It may be good for you. It's just so a beautiful land, a promised land. But you have to also know your responsibilities. So the question is being asked, one second. Maybe time has come, being that there's the dangers and so on. So let's address that now. I addressed it to some extent, but some more questions came in. Should we be concerned that America will turn against Jews and begin, and therefore begin, we should begin to plan our exit strategy? The person writes it out this way. Dear Rabbi, I've been following your dialogue with a questioner about moving to Israel with fascination. Honestly, your response was hard to understand. Obviously, the Rebbe and previous Rebbe fled Nazi Germany. They weren't opposed escaping. Certainly it would have been prudent for all Jews to leave Europe in the early 1930s, and there were voices advocating to do just that. Can you explain what you mean by saying that Ebba wasn't in favor of escaping, when he himself escaped and the Jewish world would be much different if, if all the, human, the European Jews had done just that in the 1930s? So let me read another question which is connected to this. Based on world history, we can look back at the genocides of the Nazis, the Khmer Rouge in, Khmer Rouge, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, in Cambodia, and other similar Marxist and and Maoist genocides in Eastern Europe and China and see the commonalities between them and what led up to them. Being that America is slowly headed toward an era of Marxist socialism, and based on world history, we know that once they take over the way they maintain control and power is through persecution and genocide, what would the Rebbe's advice be to us today? What would the Rebbe advise us to do? Should we sell our properties in the USA and escape now safely and move somewhere else while we can, while we still can? In the 1920s and 30s, people in Germany said it can never happen here, and it did happen there. In the USA, we can say it can never happen here. But look at the pro-Hamas students in every college in this country. They hate us and create false justifications to harm us, and they openly admit it. Imagine if these hateful racist students ran for office and the entire Congress was filled with Elon Omars and Rashida Tlaib's Chaz Rishon. They would pass laws saying it's open season on us, and they would arrest and imprison police officers and judges that tried to protect us just like they arrested Trump. So would the Rebbe say to stay here and not worry or to escape before the pogrom begins? So there's a few points here. First of all, the presumption that it's exactly like it was then or even similar to what was then is a presumption. The Rebbe never embraced that approach. He never did and my opinion is that the Rebbe would not change that position now. Yes, it's not pleasant. But to say that this is the situation of Pikuach Nefesh. Pikuach Nefesh, when you know clearly and you see clearly that there's danger, and the Rebbe was in France, and the Fidika Rebbe in, in Latvia, it was very clear what the Matzav was. That was not up for uh, a theory. So to just make a statement because it was that way there, that's why it's like that here, is not correct. It's just not. Now, God, God forbid, that a situation should be like that? That's a whole other discussion. But that's a big assumption. That's a big if. You can make a very strong argument the opposite. The United States is not Germany. The United States, is, its majority is pro-Israel and pro-Jewish, and it will not turn that way for many reasons. So the discussion would only be if it was a situation like that. So we can't just assume that what you're saying, because in Germany they thought it wouldn't happen, it did happen, that's why every situation, even if we don't think it'll happen, it's going to happen. You can't make that statement and be responsible. The fact is, is America is good to the Jewish people. Shluchim and Chabad are thriving and doing their work. When the Abishta wants us to go to Mashiach and come and go to so obviously we go. 
But meanwhile, Pi Hashem Yachma, Pi Hashem Yisu. So that's the first point regarding the question that was, was asked here. So the escaping, the point I was making was that escaping, we're not talking about escaping Nazi Europe. We're talking about just running away because there may be such a fear is not something we, I, I'm ready to say that the Rebbe would say that now. And if someone's ready to say they have to take a chreis to make such a, a bold statement. So that's the key distinction. That doesn't mean we, have to, we don't, shouldn't fight these forces and oppose them and sue and litigate the universities and others that are discriminating against Jews, by all means. Which frankly couldn't have been done in Germany. Because the laws were changed. The government became completely anti-Jewish. The government itself. Okay. So it's also an attitude of not creating a panic. I mean, with that attitude, I remember when Crown Heights, for example, was filled with Jews when I grew up as a child. And then there, was a, the, then there were the changes, the urban changes that happened in all the urban communities in New York and Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit. And the whites began to run. And crime grew to the point there were really terrible crimes. And there were people who were instigating and creating a panic. They were called blockbusters. They were convincing Jews, you have to run now or else the prices of your house will go down to nothing. And the Rebbe fought it with all. He could have said, hey, time has come, time to run. That not an approach. Besides all the halachas involved, as the Rebbe spoke, Pesach, Achel Shem Pesach, Tov Shem Chavtes. He spoke about Simen Shem Chavtes. In this regard, you can't just sell your houses and just put other people at risk. I, Yusoba Poel, went for a second. There was crime. There were people being, God forbid, murdered. It was very dangerous times. At that. But that's not a tailored approach, that we think the worst. You think the best, you're prudent, you, you, you obviously you protect yourself, you're the police, and you do everything possible to defend yourself. Imagine someone would come up and say, now that Hamas and the Arab world is turning on Israel, maybe everyone should leave Israel. It's dangerous. And find a place, hide under a rock. I understand people say there's an army there and so on. So there's an element of betochen, and obviously we build a strong army and we do whatever we take, takes to protect ourselves. So that's a general attitude that one has to take in life in general. Same thing when it came to South Africa. Very good reason to leave. And many did. Two thirds, or I don't know what the number is, big numbers of Jewish people left. But we know the Rebbe's answer. And that's why Chabad did not leave. Even in the former Soviet Union, where it was Mamash Asakana. So the Rebbe never forced anyone to do anything, but he encouraged those that listened to him that you're there because you could help other Eden. I, you're, put, you're in danger? You know, that's the Shlichus. Now, if it's Bekoach and Efesh Mamash, you're talking about in Germany, in a Nazi concentration camp, and in a second they can arrest you in that way, like the Rebbe was when he was in France with the Rebbe. Then you're talking about direct, a direct threat. In the former Soviet Union was, in a sense, but not to the extent that you knew that you're going to be arrested no matter what. Many, 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 some were, but many were not. So this requires more discussion case by case in every given situation. But obviously we're not talking here about the immediate threat and danger. Because then the, all the halachas change because that's like a burning building. You got to get out of burning. You don't say stay in the burning building because you're going to save someone that may be living there. Yes, if there's someone there to living, you try to save them, but you don't stay there for the obvious reasons, the danger involved. Okay. So no, we should not be concerned that America will turn against Jews and plan an exit strategy. If you have a good reason you want to move, and the reason is not compromise any of your shlichus and your veda, then ask your mashpi, ask your rov, and decide accordingly. Another person wrote, how could the Friedrich Kareb visit Israel and then leave from there? And this is the context, was also a follow-up. It was like this. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. In your last MLCA broadcast, that's meaning of life, Meaningful Life, 
My life, rather, Hasidus supplied, MLCA. I didn't see that before. In your last MLCA broadcast, you explained that the Friedrich Rebbe traveled to Israel to pr- prostrate himself and pray at the graves of the righteous. Being that in previous broadcasts you taught the idea that one possible reason our Rebbe didn't visit Israel is that if one person comes to Israel, there's a question of whether they should leave. Why did the Friedrich Rebbe disregard that? So yes, that was one of the reasons that um, I brought up, which the Rebbe himself has mentioned, but there's also many other reasons. Now this does not mean, it means there are questions involved. If you go to Israel, can you just leave? So the Rebbe never said definitively, I can't, but he didn't want to go into that area. Of course you can leave, for example, if you have a tafkid, a, a Teira mission where you are, you can just justify it. But you're not ready, what do you have to go there? The Friedrich Kerebbe, firstly I rely that he knew all these chashbenes and all the halachas, and he felt that he could leave. So this was not a definitive statement that you can't leave. You ask a rabbi, you'll see many people do visit Israel and they leave, and they're halachic people. Because there are hatedim and there are ways to... Now do you go with that intention? The Friedrich Rebbe felt the importance to go to Israel, and he felt the importance to leave there. So I can't really explain all the... I don't know the chashbenes of the Friedrich I don't know the chashbenes of the Rebbe for that matter. So among all the reasons, that's one of the factors to throw in there. But clearly, there's also other factors. So that's the response to that question. Okay. Now, moving on. Since we're talking about the war with Hamas, anti-Israel protests, let's do a few questions on that topic. So someone asked, should we, should we be looking at the events of October 7th as deeper blessings hidden in the curses. To spell it out, this week I told my husband and kids the story that when the Mitla Rebbe was traveling somewhere for Shabbos, when they read the Torah and came to the Teichacha, the rebuke, he fainted. When they asked him what happened, he said the curses were so frightening he fainted. They said, but you hear this Pasha every year. Why did you faint only this time? He said, when my father, the Alta Rebbe, reads the portion, I only hear the blessings. His father would usually read. That week, his father was not there or he was not where his father was. And the subsequent explanation that there really aren't any curses, but some of the blessings come from such a lofty, sublime place, they are concealed and appear as curses. As I discussed, I believe, last week, I gave a class about it as well in the last few days. The next day, we were driving up the FDR drive and another car cut us off and my husband shouted vulgar profanities at the other driver. I said, how could you say such curses in front of the kids? And he, and he replied that he didn't curse the other driver, but gave him great blessings from such a high place, and they had to come into the world concealed as curses. I know my husband was just joking, but it made me think. What if all the negative things in the world are really just huge blessings that are concealed as curses and negativity? If so, could we also try to find the sublime blessings hidden within October 7th? I personally am not able to see how the number, I'm sorry, how the murder of 1,200 innocent people can be a hidden blessing. Maybe Rabbi Jacobson can find a way to show us how October 7th was really a hidden blessing. So first of all, let me, let's separate a few points here. Number one, no, this does not justify anyone cursing. Your husband shouldn't have cursed. If he wanted to say, express himself, maybe he should have found other words. So of course it was joking, but even as a joke, it's not, not fitting, it's not the story. The Alter Rebbe is reading the Torah, and the Torah is a Teichach, that's Teira Sashem. And when he reads, he reads the blessings. That doesn't give a justification for anybody to curse anyone, or to in general say anything that's a profanity or a nivel pe, or a, or a curse. So let's just make that very clear. Getting to the very topic, so when a Teira says a Teichacha, and that really it's blessings, like the Gemara Moed Katan, that the Semach Tzedek in his gloss on the Maimer Lekut Teira Buchel Kesai, Ashbis told his son that the, what, the, what you heard from those sages that blessed, that cursed, that seemed like they cursed you, is really all brachas. So that's again the brachas of, of, of the words of Tzadikim, or the words of the Teira itself. 
and they believe our brachas. Chesadim nistarim, hidden chesadim. Can that be then carried over and say that every time a negative thing happens, it's a really a bracha? So we have, of course, the Gemara that says, Kishem she mevarchen ala teva, kach mevarchen ala klola. Ala ro, on a negative thing. We have gamzu teva. That also, this is teva. We have the idea that, that it's really all for the good. Letov avdin. Everything Hashem does is ultimately for the good. I don't know if you can just compare them all. There is the element that everything, even the negative, has a positive energy and ultimately will lead to something positive. But I think when it comes to the, especially the story with the Alter Rebbe, that's a unique element in it. So in general, yes, it's associated with it. So are we supposed to look at October 7th, or the Holocaust for that matter, and say it's really brachas? Lavdavka. People were hurt, people were killed. Like the Rebbe says, we don't justify the Shah, we don't try to explain it away and say it's really a bracha. Can you grow from it personally in the Gavra? Of course you can. And people have grown through it. But we don't say the Ebersheth sent a bracha, but the bracha was so deep it had to take on the shape of a negative experience. So I think we have to separate the two and not just make one long, one big package of this that every negative thing is really a bracha. Can it turn into a bracha? Can you reveal the bracha in it? Can it become a bracha for you that you've grown from it? But like we speak about Chassidus about the tzimtzum, the tzimtzum is heipacharotzim. Even though it's Bishvil Hagili, the tzimtzum, all purpose of the tzimtzum, the concealment is to bring out deeper kaychis and to bring out a deeper level of godliness. But the tzimtzum itself is heipach, and something negative is negative. So that's the distinction I would make regarding this. So, for example, October 7th, and its events brought out more Avas Yisrael and more unity by Eden. You don't say that's the bracha that happened. You say we, we learned how to transform it. We've learned, we've grown from it. Like the Rambam says, not mikra niklis. We've, through introspection, we've become better people. But it's not saying that what happened and those type of atrocities or any atrocity is a, is a bracha in disguise. Someone else writes a different question. That's regarding that. If the Palestinians turn out to be from the lost 12 tribes, would we welcome them? What will we do if Mashiach comes and says the Palestinians are from the lost tribes and are Jewish and we have to accept them into our community? Would someone step up and do a gedalia on them? On, on them, like, you know, same gedalia. It's a very hypothetical question. I don't even want to answer it because if that happens, I'm sure Mashiach and whoever identifies them will tell us what to do. At this point, there's no reason to assume something like that at all. And therefore, uh, there's nothing more to say in that topic. And how they will be redeemed? If they do tshuva, they'll be redeemed. If they don't do tshuva, there's other ways that God deals with enemies. Okay. Another, fun, another question. This is so much here. I'm just trying to see which one to do. Yeah, okay, let's talk about one more thing here. Um, Donald Trump. What should our reaction be to the Trump verdict? We know the verdict this past week that the jury found him unanimously guilty on all 34 counts. So what should be the reaction? We've got quite a few questions about this. These topics I usually don't like to talk about, not because... They're not interesting, but because it is applied. Is it politics? Is it gossip? Is it just things we should just ignore altogether? But since people are asking the question, let's address it the best of our ability of how Taka Teir Chassidic approach would be to looking at this. Is it something we should even be talking about and be, being kochenzich in this and so on? 
So overall, everything that a person does should be connected to serving Hashem. Politics is often completely distraction. People may enjoy talking politics, but what does it have to do with Abishta? When the Rebbe would speak about politics, so to speak, it was always because something that we learned from that for what a Yid has to do with serving Hashem. What's good for Yid and what's good for Teda. So the discussion about Trump and Biden, who should win the election, for example, I'm not telling anyone not to talk about it and not have opinions on it. But it's something that the Rebbe would address. You don't see that he generally addressed candidates. I will say, what about pro-Israel, anti-Israel? The Rebbe felt Israel has to do what it has to do. And America will go along. It was never choose a certain president because he's more pro-Israel. There were presidents that Rebbe spoke about in a positive way that were not so pro-Israel. This again doesn't mean that you can't have a personal opinion, but to bring, we're, we're talking Echsidus applied. So I think we have to have that clarity and distinction. And yes, some people say, look at the travesty. Political attack, just trying to get Trump out of the way. And all these trumped up, trumped up charges are all meaningless. And in general, it's all a rigged and so on. How do you address all of that? So let me read a few questions and I'll respond to the best of my ability. So the person writes like, writes like this. Even though President Trump is clearly a flawed person, without a doubt he was the president with the best relationship with Israel than any other president. He negotiated the Abraham Accords and Hamas was afraid to do a major attack during Trump's term. Is there anything in the Torah that tells us how to react to Trump being found guilty of falsifying business records to cover up payments? Were there any stories in the Torah of kings or leaders that were friendly to Israel but then got imprisoned? And if so, what happened afterward? Can we separate Trump, the president, who had good policies and did good things, from Trump, the person who committed immoral acts? Our own King David has some personal flaws, but was still a holy man and a great king, and Mashiach will come from David. So what, it, what, what should we think? So first of all, I don't appreciate necessarily the comparison between Trump and, and, and David HaMelech. I understand the point you're making. So, you know, Trump is a human being, not a David HaMelech, a Havdal, wouldn't even compare, come close to it. The flaws are the flaws. The question has to simply be is this. Is it someone that should be the President of the United States? Is he talk good for the causes we believe in, Israel, Jews, and so on? And what are the alternatives? So that every person has to make that decision. I'm not going to declare here one way or the other. Yes, he was good for Israel. Most likely, he would probably be better for Israel now than his opponent. From the history and other factors. Is that the reason you should vote for him? That's up to you. But to make him into a, a, a messiah or to make him into some type of martyr, we don't have to overdo it. He may be, he may be the right one. As far as what's going on here, of course you can explain the politics of it. Listen, throughout Trump's whole, uh, whole term, they politicized it, accused him of collusion, all kinds of things. Is this whole thing uh, a fake? And they found things that everybody does almost daily and they turned it into a major crime to embarrass him? or to call him a convicted felon, to win the election? Very possible. I'm not going to say no. Is that a reason, for example, to vote for him? I think he may have a backlash, and he may actually get him elected, because many people will see the sham and will turn for him. Very possible. I cannot speak from the eyes of Torah and Chassidus and say I have clarity on that. The clarity has to be that we don't have to be identified by all of this. It's not what def- defines us. At the same time, to be prudent and practical, what, how this all, what this leads to. But to turn this into our passion, we now have to fight for Trump because they're setting him up. Even if it's true, is that our job? Our job is to make sure that the best possible president will be elected, that will be good for the Yidden, good for Israel, and good for all of us. So I just want to distinguish between the two. So on rights. So the fact that a king is immoral, I mean, He's not a king, Trump. He's a human being. 
And I wouldn't start bringing that into as if everything he does is so holy, but he made a few mistakes. You don't have to make him holy. You don't have to make him into a, into a perfect human being altogether. And try to find what, uh, uh, that, that every, per, every person has flaws. He has flaws. And you know what? Maybe he could be his own worst enemy too. Remember, every person can make, th- make mistakes. And many people argue he could have won the second, uh, his second term if he had not spoken something if he wasn't so the way he was. Are we allowed to dive in for Donald Trump and say to Hillen that Hashem helped him f- fight these fake political charges? If you're allowed to or not, you have to ask Arov. I'm not going to pass on that. I don't think it's something we should be doing, davening for someone. You know, you want to daven for a full shleimer for someone? It's one thing. I don't know if that's the approach, if you ask me. Someone else writes something, I don't even want to read it, but did Donald Trump, a type of Mashiach ben Yasef, and does his arrest and conviction pave the way for Mashiach ben David to step up and lead into, us into the redemption? The only reason I'm reading it is just saying, let's not overdo this. Let's, let's be, it's not, this is already off the reservation. This is not, can he be good in certain ways? But let's not turn him into more of a, the, you know, I think when you do something like that, you end up overreaching with things with moderation. That's, you know, he's an interesting character, has his qualities. I'm sure he has his major flaws as well. And I think we just have to look at it much more practically than anything else. Okay. So let's conclude. Let's conclude on a positive note. And a positive note is that we are now, as I said, the end of month of Ir, about to enter in the month of Sivan. Shchedish Sivan. Ki Ishachad Belevachad. Hashem should help us all that we should find that unity and make it sustainable. Ki Ishachad Belevachad does not mean that we, uh, we compromise our individuality, but it's all part of one mosaic. The harmony within diversity that is the hallmark of Chedesh Sivan. And Har Sinai has the power to draw that out of us. And our unity should spill over to unity in the whole world. Shalom. Shalom ba'elam. Especially the month of Matan Teda. Should be Shalom, permanent Shalom, and Asati Shalom Oretz. The Gula Amit is Vashlema. This has been My Life Chassidah Supplied. We're here every Sunday. Next week we will celebrate the 500th episode. And please contribute generously at in our campaign, mylife500.com. Thank you so much. We should only have brochet, betev, hanirev, anigla. Call tuv. This program is brought to you by My Life Chassidah Supplied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidahsupply.com slash donate.